just a small welcome to all. I see John Dargan is here, the old commissioner of the park. Yay. Pat Quinn is here. Pat Quinn is the lifetime member of DW Field Park Association. And there's not many of them. <laughs> lifetime members. There's plenty of members, but not lifetimes. Pat Hull, the former president, has done everything for the board. Welcome, Pat. And I'm just going to give a small report. Last year we did two movies in the park, which was free to all the people. We had free popcorn. We sold soda and necklaces real cheap. And we made a few dollars. This year it's going to be even better. We sold an, an ad book, and the ad book is almost filled up completely. Reason being, this is an election year, so a lot of people bought an ad and put an ad in. As well as Mark Lindy, he just bought an ad today for the ad book. He, you know, hopefully we'll get it in in time. And that movie is How to Train Your Dragon. Hidden World is the new one. That was the newest movie out. That particular movie was released on May 21st, which is only about two weeks ago. So it's a brand new movie, and that was suggested by Pat Jensen's daughter. I don't see her here. I'm sure she's coming. I was gonna ask Frank to come up to give a small treasury report. In this treasury report, I understand it's for the whole entire year. Real brief. Frank? Thank you, Tim. All right, Treasurer's Report for fiscal year 2018. I should, I should, I'm sorry, 2019. All right, um, we had a starting balance of $17,893.70. Expenses for the year totaled $8,621.81. Income for the year was $9,905 even, with a balance as of May 31st, the last day of our fiscal year, of $19,173.89. Respectfully submitted, Frank Early, Treasurer. Any questions? Yes? Out of the income from that fiscal year, do we know how much of that was membership dues? I haven't broken it down. I just put together a in and out type of uh, report, all right? But um, dues comprise a small amount of that. Single biggest expense. Single biggest expense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it, it would have to be Tower Fest because there's a lot of money laid out for that. However, you know, we, we do uh, sell food. We also get the um, the uh, grant from the Cultural Council, which helps cover part of it, and um, we get some very generous donations from folks that help cover costs. All right. Any other questions on the Treasurer's report? Great. Thank you. We need a motion to accept as read, and not, it's just going to be put on file. Naturally, that'll be to sent to the auditor. I second that. The motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Unanimous. Secretary's report, Stephanie. Yeah, I, um, I'm stepping in for Stephanie now because it's a handwritten report. I was afraid she might not be able to see. Come on up, Pat. Just the microphone for the. Hello, everybody. Oh, please. <laughs> The DW Field Park Association annual meeting, June 23rd, 2020, was at Enzo Flats on Center Street. It was called to order at 920 by President Tim Sullivan. A brief welcome by Pat Hull. Secretary's report was read and accepted. The Treasurer's report by Frank Gurley reported a current balance of $17,458.10 and that the books <coughs> are at the auditors. Um, Tim Sullivan read <coughs> the proposed slate of offices that was printed in the program and he called 
for any nominations from the floor. There were none, and then Frank called for a motion that the secretary cast a unanimous ballot for the slate as presented. And the, <coughs> excuse me, Mem <clears throat> after the, the election, members were reminded that our first movie night in the park would be July 27th. It would be the Lion King. And Tower Fest will be on October the 6th. And volunteers would sign up, please. A motion was made to adjourn the business meeting by Pat Hull, seconded by Pat Gorman. Tim, <coughs> excuse me, introduced the speaker, who was Sean Kent from the Audubon Society, who gave an interesting, informative talk on the monarch butterfly. And we then had refreshments. So, are there any corrections or omissions to the secretary's report? Any questions on that report? Make a motion to accept. Second. A motion has been made and seconded to accept the report as read. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimous. On this agenda, I got the election of officers, and I was going to read the slate off. I'll read it all off and get it on the, on the record. This is the slate of officers that is presented today. President Tim Sullivan, Vice President Paul Reed, Recording Secretary Stephanie Danielson, Treasurer Frank Gurley, Corresponding Secretary Claire Lindbury, Trustee for three years Dave Gorman and Joe Rukas, Rukauskas, Trustee for two years, John Van Klucken, Klucken, Van Kuyken, Josette Cochran Lusk, Trustee for one year, Janet Trask, and John Studley. Are there any nominations from the floor? Yes, Pat. I want to nominate myself for something. What are we voting on here, Pat? This is all the officers. No, just. My mistake. We're voting on two. The president, vice president, court secretary, treasurer, and corresponding secretary's offices expire next next year. They do. Right. So the election today is just for the trustees of three years. Yeah. Dave, Dave Gorman and Joe Rakowskis. Great. I'll nominate myself to be a trustee. Um, I'm Joe Rakowskis. We need a second on that nomination. I'll second that. Pat Quinn has nominated has been nominated as a trustee. Any other nominations from the floor? Mr. President, the position that Pat Quinn has been uh, nominated for, we know specifically what position that is. Yes, trustee for three years. Trustee for three years. So who is he replacing? We have to vote on it. No, you didn't have to vote on it. It has to be voted on, Pat. So right now, as I can see it, is that we're voting on just the trustees for three years. Correct. Two people have been nominated previously named Dave Gorman and Joe Rakowskis. Correct. And there's been a nomination on the floor for myself, Patrick Quinn. Correct. So it seems to me that the order of business is to vote on those three candidates uh, by ballot of some sort for the trustees of three years. Did, I'm going to leave it up to the people. Do you want to vote by hand, or do you want a ballot vote on this? Those so three people. My, my only question was, <clears throat> there, there are two openings for next year. Who is it that's going off the board this year? Dave Gorman and Joe Rakowskis. Okay. Well, they're up for re-election, so, right? It's just that everybody understands. Those are the Patrick two positions that are open. Joe is running. Dave Gorman, Gorman is running. Gorman is running. There are three people who are ne ne nominated or are on this slate for next year. So if you call their names, 
we can do I or nay. I'll just raise the hands. It's very obvious who's being elected, that's fine. If it's very close, then we will have a written ballot. And you'll just Does everybody tea, understand right? that? Right. Is it only a two-man position? Yes, it is. A two-person position. Man or woman. Yeah. All right, I'll go in order. And the order is Dave Gorman is number one, Joe Rakosis is number two, and Pat Quinn is number three. And you're going to vote for two or three? You're going to vote for two out of the three. If, if you r raise your hands, I'm going to count everybody. For Dave Gorman, number one. This is very awkward. Does Dave yeah. want to be reelected? He hasn't said. <laughs> if you could just raise your hand and give me a chance to count Dave Gorman, number one. Three votes. Does he want to be reelected? She already asked that. We don't know. Yes, he does. He does want to burn. Yes, he did not resign. It's an election. Yeah, he, he doesn't have to be here. It's an election. He's running a road race. Right, that's right. right Dave Gorman has three votes. Okay. Joe Rakowskis. If you raise your hand for Joe Rakowskis. Fifteen, Joe Rakowskis. You have to know who's, who, who voted because you can't vote three times. You can only vote twice, people. So let's stay on this. Yes, yes, yes. I think we trust. Third nomination is Pat Quinn. If you could raise your hands for Pat Quinn. It, keep in mind, you can only vote for two people. Nine for Pat Quinn. Fifteen. I'll repeat it all so everybody knows. It looks like Dave Gorman has been voted out. Dave Gorman got three votes. Joe Rokowska got fifteen. Pat Quinn got nine. So the election is over. Dave Gorman has been elected out. We need a motion from the secretary to cast one vote for the slate of officers, the remainders. Stephanie? Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I thought we were only voting for the trustees for three years. All the other officers and trustees positions still adhere until next, next, next year. Right. Okay. okay, you're right. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. <coughs> it's, it's not that I'm right, that's the process that right. is correct. Any old business? Any new business? Mr. President. <clears throat> yes, Frank. Just, um, just so that everybody knows, um, the uh, the movie that you mentioned earlier, which is next Friday. Okay, um, I received the copy of the movie. Yes, I also received a copy of the license for the movie. So, just want to make sure everybody's aware of it. Is all the electricity running fine up there? Yeah, we've got plenty of electricity, lots of electrons. We plug in, Pat, to the maintenance check in the back. Yeah. We plug it right in. You never know. It could be a monster. Chewing on wires. Well, they have about six boxes you can use out there. Yes? I, I just had a couple of questions as a member. Okay. Um, can you just state your name, please? Pat Turner. Thank you. Yes, Pat. Um, when are the regular meetings and are non-officers allowed to attend the regular meetings? No, it's a, we have a board of directors meeting every month. Okay, so only the people who are on the board of directors? Correct, they have to be on the board. Okay. I want information, I think that's incorrect. I was yeah. on the board before and, and any member of this organization can go to the, to the executive board members, members meetings. It's whether or not you're able to actually participate in that meeting, which right. you wouldn't be able to because you're not on, the, on that board. Right. But if any board member wanted you to speak or participate, then you could do that. All right, I stand corrected. I didn't this know is, that. This is a, this is a public. This is a 
a nonprofit organization that's serving the community, and we don't want to we don't want to limit any type of activity of we membership in any of these members meetings and try to invite people to vote. Yeah. It has been a practice in the past to have a board members at the board meeting and if anybody extra wants to speak, we have them come. But yeah, so you're, you're welcome to go to the board meetings. The yeah. board meetings. Okay. And the third Thursday of the month, every month. Okay. At the park office? Park department down on okay. Middle Lane. My, my concern is I've been a member for a number of years and it seems like there's very little communication going out to ordinary members. The only time that I've received communication is for the annual meeting and for Tower Fest, when then people, you want all kinds of help. I have no idea what's going on <coughs> in the association, what the association is yeah. doing. I'm in the dark, and I've been a member for a long time. I've never been on the board, but I would I'm really clueless about what the association is doing. When we have a meeting coming up this Thursday. Why don't you come on down? All right. And just so you know, we have a a movie Friday night. It's I'm aware of that. The movie's free to the, the entire yeah. public. Oh. Free popcorn as well. Yeah, I mean, I got that. Okay. With the, the thing for today. I just want to mention that we have the copyright for that as well. Because okay. there was a little bit of trouble last time. Oh, two movies ago. Yes, Frank. All right, Mr. President, it's um, a good point. Okay, it's a very good point. And we've talked about it at the meetings. How can we open up communication to the rest of the members? All right. Joe Rakowski suggested a newsletter. Okay. That's on the table. We'll put together. We do have a Facebook page where we try to update things on the Facebook page. We have a website <coughs> that, quite frankly, is broken. And the person who has all the uh, secret codes is among the missing, so um, we're trying to fix that, okay? And we would welcome anybody that has any expertise in that area who wants to write a newsletter, you know, put it out once a month. We, we want to collect email uh, addresses so that we can send it out once a month to the um, population, all right? So that we can you know, have, have larger meetings, okay, and have more people participate. All right, so we're working on that. All right, but uh, by all means, come to the meeting next week. Okay. All right, and um, we would welcome you. Thank you. Any other questions, Pat? Yeah, in a similar vein, I, I, I know there used to be members invited on a fairly regular basis to uh, meetings at Campello with a speaker, uh, or someone from. Waterland, Carl, where different people came and did presentations. And I too was very aware that I'm getting two notices a year and don't really know what's going on. Uh, certainly, I'd like to know what the Facebook site, what you do to get there, if you don't know it. Uh, website, didn't know it existed. And a uh, more positive thing, I have a friend from Brockton who is an absolute whiz. His profession is building websites, and a lot of people know who he is here, I won't mention his name right now, but if there's a need, I could talk to someone from the board, see what you need, and then I might be able to talk to him and see if he would <coughs> sit down with you guys and help you out there. Right. Um, Pat, would you give your phone you number? Yeah. Pat Monahan. Pat, would you give your, at the end of the meeting, give your number to Frank? Yes, Mark. So I, I just joined today. I've been coming here for years to cover your stuff, and uh, we certainly have a cable channel that will offer you all the publicity you want if you let us know ahead of time. Um, and I would certainly, I signed up when I joined. I, I checked off newsletter and uh, Facebook. I'm on the Historical Society board, and we had the same issues that this group did with people having our codes and getting our website back. It, it took a good year to get that all formed together, but it's the way that people communicate now, and I'll be glad to help you out any way I can. Thank you. Did you hear that, Frank? Yep. We got a newsletter. Oh, man. 
I would do it small. I would start small, yeah, do it quarterly, and then build it up, and you know, send out like uh, e blasts, like on uh, Mailchimp or uh, Constant Contact or something like that, because that makes it easier than we can build it to the website. We can even do a TV show. We can't stop with Warren Peace on it? No, no. Hang on one second, Pat. Just a link to uh, Brock. Yeah. Hang on, yeah. Pat. I just want to read off again to join us at the DW Field Park behind the maintenance check, June 21st, 2019, for a free movie. The movie is How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World. I uh, also want to announce that Tower Fest is October 12th, 2019. Volunteers are always needed. And the second movie's coming up in Oct August. I'm not sure of the date. Yes, Pat. Um, just with respect to scheduling and all that, I'd like to, I'm going to make a motion that we postpone the business part of this meeting to get onto our speakers so that we don't delay our speaker who's been here. And so I'd like to make a motion that we um, postpone the business part of the meeting until after our speaker moved to our speaker's presentation because it's already 9.35. Um, yes, Stephanie. I'll second that. A motion has been made and seconded. Um, I have a father in the hospital that I need to go see, so it sounds like the business part of this meeting probably is close to wrapping up. Can we wrap it up? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sure. All right, we'll wrap up the business meeting. Any other old business? So can I make a motion? I'll withdraw my motion. Thank you. Can I make a motion that we wrap up the business portion of this meeting? Yes, you can. I'll second that. Need a motion to adjourn? Adjourn. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Meeting adjourned. And I'd like to introduce Mr. Sean Kent from the of the American Bo American Board Art of the Mass Audubon Society. He's going to speak about native bees. Sean. Yes. Museum of American Bird Art. Sean Kent. He's going to show the movie about the bees. Sean. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here um, for now, I guess, uh, now the third uh, year in a row at your annual meeting. Um, I love all the work that you're doing at the DW Fields uh, Park Association. And I just wanted to introduce myself um, in terms of like what I'm doing and what we're doing there. So I run the education department for the Museum of American Bird Art, which is one of Mass Audubon's 60 wildlife sanctuaries. And so we're about 15 minutes away in Canton. And we have an art museum that's devoted to American bird artists. Uh, we're actually opening up an exhibition today. That's where I'm going to right after this uh, by a printmaker from Maine and Colorado named Sherry York. We have a 120-acre wildlife sanctuary there as well. And we do programming up from you know, infants up through uh, last week I had somebody on a program that was 100 years old. So we, we run the gamut from talks like this to nature and art summer camp. We'll have about 400 or so campers starting in a little more than a week from now, about 50, 60 per week, depending on the session. And we do talks like this. I do nature walks. And my background is as a field biologist and ecologist where I've done now about 12 years of work on native bees and wild bees in the area where when I was in graduate school at Northeastern University I became involved with a uh, project on the Boston Harbor Islands through Harvard University uh, Museum of Comerate Zoology and Edward E.O. Wilson's Institute there where I went to Harvard one day to volunteer because they were collecting all living, all things without a backbone, all invertebrates in the Boston Harbor Islands to identify everything. It was called an all taxa biodiversity survey. And they asked me to do some research uh, so to look at and collect bees. And I thought bumblebees, honeybees, carpenter bees. And I was like, okay, that'll be easy because I didn't know anything really about it. And I didn't, you know, and they, op they were doing the work for about two or three months and they opened up all these drawers and they had 50 or 60 species just from the Boston Harbor Islands of bees that were there. And that brought me along my pathway here. And I'm really thrilled to talk about that today um, with you. One thing that I wanted to bring up as well, um, we've written a lot of cultural council grants through the museum and successfully gotten them to do work with uh, 
little kids and their families or caregivers in library programs. And one of the things we've been successful with was in Stoughton, that's expanded to where we're actually going into the Stoughton parks to do nature-based like steam programming where they do an art project building clay, uh, maybe building like, for example, like we did a baby bird nest program. They saw the real nest, we looked for nests, and then the, they made their own bird's nest out of clay and other natural materials to take home and then paint. So in September, I'm writing a Mass Audubon, well me, I'm writing a grant to support that work in Stoughton. I, I thought if you're interested, like the DW Fields, that would be nice to do something like that there, and I'd be more than happy to talk with you more about that. But it could fund anywhere between like six and 12 programs, uh, you know, in a year to bring more people out to the park. And then um, I can talk about other things that we're doing there, but I just wanted to bring that up just to put that out there. Uh, sorry to cut in at the beginning of the talk there. Um, there as well. And I've been teaching for about 17 years science and stuff like this too. But now, uh, what's the buzz? What about the bees? So, any flowering plants that we have um, that you see like in your gardens right now or you can think of the cherry trees or your maple trees or any, anything like that coming out in spring, a lot of those plants require or really benefit from pollen being transferred from one flower to, the, to another flower so they can make seeds. So when you look around, more than 70% of the flowering plants that we have, so this is like not pine trees or grasses, but most everything else that you're seeing, you know, there's a, you know, 70 to 80% need pollination by animals. Otherwise, you're not going to get the fruits or you're not going to get the seeds from the plants. And then 40% of the world's crops, so anything from almonds, to cherries, to strawberries, they either benefit from or require animals, and bees are really well adapted to this, to produce food. So if we start to lose pollinators, unlike other animals, and in, in, this, in this case bees, this is what you're looking for your food sources here. Okay, you're basically looking at just grains, corn, bread. So I hope you like bread, okay? Because this is what you might be looking at here. So to kind of center this and ground this, I want you to think about the taste of like spring and summer. So what's blooming, what's starting to turn into fruit right now. And I want to look at two just uh, plants. So we've got stuff in like the vacciniums, the heath, and in this case, blueberries. Like I think of the blueberries, uh, high bush and low bush blueberries. If you're walking near wetlands here, you might have growing in uh, your yards. And then tomatoes right here. So these are all bloom, either starting to bloom now or blooming early. You can think cranberries, huckleberries here. So I want to show a short little movie video here. It's a little washed out, but it should, should play well. And let's, Bumblebees okay. have particularly large and heavy bodies, and flight for them can be a real effort. So when you think of the cold the days in spring, spring when okay. The are cold, and green bumblebees are just emerging from their winter sleep. It's only a few degrees. And as you think about this, I want you to take your back muscles off of your arms. Because that's what the bumblebees are doing here. They're detaching their muscles from their wings. And I want you to walk. She's only a few degrees warmer than the surrounding vegetation. If the thermal camera clearly shows. The purple is cold. It's like 40 degrees. The bumblebees right here. She can put her wings out of gear so that without moving them, she can rev up the wing muscles inside and that raises the temperature within her thorax by 20 degrees centigrade or even more. So she took the That's muscles the off her wings and is vibrating, shivering. So she went from 40 degrees to over 100 degrees in about two minutes. And she can't fly until she's about 105, depending on the species. So this insect's realistically warm-blooded and endothermic. While it's still too cold for others to do so. The long 
cool trumpets of the daffodils retain heat very well, and they're still warm even after their hot-bodied visitors have left. So even on like those 40 degree days, 50 degree days where there's no other insects flying around, it's drizzly, it's even raining a little bit. If it's really raining, they can't fly. The bumblebees are coming out and are pollinating these plants. So when you look at your blueberries and you think of those, especially going up to Maine where a lot of blueberries from around here may be coming from, those cold mornings, these bumblebees are out pollinating all these plants. And then you can think of the wild blueberries, high and low bush blueberry you might need to see on wetlands. They're probably at DW Fields Park when you're walking by if you're looking for it. Huckleberries, cranberries, a lot of these plants and then all the trees really need a healthy population of bumblebees to produce seeds so they can have another generation in the future here. And the cold, they're, they're well adapted to survival on these cold mornings. And this, the reason I have tomato up here is this really really interesting thing called buzz pollination. Okay? So when they detach, they, they're literally detaching their, their muscles in their thorax <laughs> from their wings. They're hooking them and unhooking them, hooking and unhooking them, and then they're vibrating and that warms up their body. But this muscle vibration, when they land on these flowers here, I'm going to show a video about that, uh, where they're hooking and unhooking right there. <clears throat> that vibration releases pollen. And I want to show that because it's really neat. And these are all, all from YouTube, these videos. This buzzing is a secret password, the key to a lock. What this bumblebee is after is pollen. Bumblebees eat pollen. It's high in protein. But the flower doesn't want to give it to just anyone. So it hides it away in those bright yellow anthers. For a flower, that's unusual. Most flowers keep their pollen on the outside of the anther, which is the male part of the flower. Pollen is basically sperm for plants. Most flowers make sugary nectar, too. They use it as bait to attract bees and other pollinators, which get coated in pollen along the way. And since bees are messy, they inadvertently scatter some of that pollen onto the female part of the next flower they visit. That's how most flowers have sex. But this type of flower doesn't offer nectar. The only way to get to its pollen is through those tiny pores at the ends. But the bumblebee knows just what to do. It wraps its legs around the flower and bites down on the anthers, that male part of the flower. See those wings shaking? Normally, the bumblebee uses those powerful muscles to flap its wings. That's what makes the buzzing sound when they fly. But here, those muscles vibrate its whole body. See, so, so the wings are detached again. But it makes a louder, higher pitched buzz. This vibration shakes up the pollen trapped inside the anthers until it spews out all over the bumblebee. It's called buzz pollination, and you don't need a bumblebee to do it. A tuning fork will do. So if you hum at the right frequency for your tomatoes, you can pollinate them too. <laughs> the bumblebee brings the pollen down into sticky sacks on its legs. So if you ever sing to your plants, here's your reason. <laughs> Only a few types of pollinators, like bumblebees, are capable of buzz pollination. <laughs> Honeybees can't do it. No. This field is kind of a free-for-all. Think Las Vegas buffet. Tons of food, but long lines. Lots of competition. Buzz pollination is more like a private club, by only permitting pollinators that know the secret knock flower ups the chances that its pollen will end up on flowers from the same club, the same species. The bumblebee? Well, sure, it has to work a little harder, and there's no sweet nectar. But it's a reliable pollen stash that almost no one else has access to. Tomatoes. You see the pollen flying out. Potatoes. Blueberries. All of these need buzz pollination to reproduce. 
produce. Much of the food we eat owes its existence to that buzz. Ours? So, the bumblebees, with the same way that they're heating up, controlling their body temperature, they're also using that. The, the plants have evolved to take advantage of that in, in, in blueberries, tomatoes, potatoes, and other, other groups of plants there to release pollen. Because a big issue with plants, and I'll show some slides about pollination in a little bit too, just to kind of show the pollination process here, is if they get pollen from another plant and they get it on the female part of the plant, it can clog up the whole system so they can't produce as many seeds. So they don't want, to, they don't want pollen coming from different species on to, you know, to make their seeds because it'll clog everything up. So they're really trying to get the bees to visit just blueberry flowers, and that's one way that they're doing it there. So then if you think of fall, just to kind of center this now, you know, you've got apple pie, apple crisp, pumpkin, you can also think of squashes in the later, uh, later harvest, my daughter, uh, Johanna there, okay, she's four now, my, I have another daughter her age now who's eight months too, with Serena, so there's three girls in the house. Um, but now, so just, does anybody plant squash? or uh, pumpkins or anything like that. So you, you know the big flowers that are opening up more in the morning, yes. okay, yes. right there? So if you squeeze the flower when it's still cold, or when it's still in the morning before they've opened up, it might buzz. Because there's squash bees and other longhorn bees, the males. So most of the bees that, that, you're, that, that we're gonna talk about, they're, they're solitary. They don't form colonies. It's just the female collecting pollen, digging a nest, or uh, putting a nest somewhere. The nest may have 10, 20 bees in it, but they're, they're, none of them are flying because they're all larvae, they're all babies, okay? They're all just eating the pollen here. And the males have no place to go because they're basically useless. Okay, basically is basically giving them too much credit. They're useless, okay? In terms of like the reproductive process here. They, they, they can't go back to the nest, okay? So the, the, the males will hide in the flowers here, wait for them to open to mate with the female. So in the morning, if you squeeze it, they might buzz because one is sleeping in there. When you get to the fall and look at bees at night on sunflowers, and you're like, why are they here? Or in the early morning when it's cold, those are all males because they don't have any place to go, okay? So those will be in here, and we only have one species of squash bee here, but if you went down to Arizona, New Mexico, Mexico, where squash is much more diverse, there's a lot more species down here. And then we've got other bees. There can be up to you know, 80, 90 species of these mining bees in, called Andrina, but other mining bees. And they're coming out just in the springtime for like the willows, the birches, the cherries, um, and other flowering plants in the springtime. And they're really, really good at pollinating those plants. They're adapted well to collecting the pollen. So this little tiny mining bee, if you look at your pinky fingernail, um, and I can pass these around too. I've got like 400 bees right here. Okay, for part of my research. I'm just going to open these up. They're dead. So he said. But you're looking about this big. Okay, so that's a little bit bigger. And you can get a closer look at these too. And I'll pass them around so you can look. This is just a, a little bit of the diversity here. And I'll, I'll, I'll pull them out if you just want to pass them around. And I've got, again, that's all part of my research collection. Oh, the projector got bumped. And, um, Right here, these can carry and transfer pollen seven to ten times more efficiently than honeybees, okay, to the flowers. And you'll typically, if there's a healthy population of wild bees, the apples can be a little bit bigger and sell for a little bit more. But because of the way uh, agriculture is managed, you have huge orchards, you do need to bring honeybees in for a lot of the crops based on the management. But these wild bees here, Anywhere from three billion at a low estimate up to you know, 10, 15, up to 50 billion dollars a year in US economic value is, and that's independent of honeybees on the crops. And so they're really good buffers to the commercial declines in honeybee colonies. And you've seen that in the news with colony collapse disorder. You know, they're really good at pollinating watermelons, strawberries, which is up here, but a lot of our native crops. And like, for example, like tomatoes, Honeybees can't pollinate those. Those have to be bumblebees. Uh, blueberries, they will bring honeybees into blueberry farms or uh, fruit orchards, I guess. But that, they're really poor pollinators and you need to bring in all, like millions of them to, to do the same effective job. I like this sign right here. It's a little hard to see just because of the resolution. Um, this is a speed limit sign 
in a farm in Oregon or Washington, it's an alfalfa farm, and alkali bees, like salt, bees that need salty soil, they are great pollinators of alfalfa, but they have to nest in like a barren sandy area across the street. So there's millions of bees flying across the street during the day. So the speed limit is 10 to 15 miles an hour, so they're not running over all the bees in the road. So this is a bee speed limit sign there. And as you can see with Dunkin' Donuts over there, okay, if you look at studies that have been done in coffee farms, especially in uh, tropical forests in Southeast Asia, if they manage their wild bee population well, where there's a healthy wild bee population, you get much more coffee beans. Okay, so when you're drinking your cup of coffee and they're managing well, you're going to drink a better cup of coffee with native bees there as well uh, in your to-go or what do they call it, box of joe, that's right. But what I want to talk about here, this is research, this is a picture from Thompson Allen, so if you're at UMass Boston to the Kennedy Library and you're looking uh, just at the island right across the water there in the harbor, this is Thompson Allen where there's an outward bound camp and, and facilities out there. Most flowering plants and trees need pollinators, and this could be flies or butterflies or other ones for pollination. So just what is pollination right here? So here's a honeybee right there that's covered in pollen. And it's a little hard to see right here, okay? But if you look, these are pollen grains magnified about 2,000 times, all right? Here's another picture of pollen grains magnified about, about 2,000 times as well with some color added so it's easier to see. So, how many people get allergies to yeah. pine? All right. Which one do you think, looking at these nine, is the one you should be mad at? So just take a second and think of which one I'm going to circle, which is the pine pollen. Upper left. Center. Center. Upper left. I say upper left. Upper left. Upper left. Upper left. Upper left. Upper left. This one right here. This right here and right here, those are balloons. They're empty air sacs. So they, when they fall off the pine tree, they float, okay? The top part is a protein, where I put the X right there. That's the protein source. Bees need to feed their babies specific proteins and nucleic acids and stuff called sterols. That's what makes your hormones. And certain types of pollens have certain types of proteins they need, certain types of nucleic acids and sterols to make the hormones so they can develop. This one right here, see how it's smoother? Mm -hmm. And it floats. And then if you look at these, this is a sunflower type pollen, daisy or sunflower. See how it's spiky? See how there's all three dimensional structures here with grooves and everything? It makes them stickier. Okay. So when you look at like this one that looks like a, uh, like a medieval mace in a way with all the spikes on it, yeah. it's more surface area so it'll stick to them better and that's why on this dandelion pollen right there that it's the, the bee's sticky. So what does that actually look like? So here's a bee and I'm going to walk around with this one just so you can get a little bit better of a sense in a high resolution picture just so you can see it a bit better. You know, you're maybe you looking. That might be, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 pollen grains attached to its face. And I'm going to show even a magnified, like maybe 2,000 times in a little bit, looking at the hairs. And you've probably sat on this bee and never noticed. <laughs> okay, you've probably sat on its nest. A lot, all the wild bees that I'm talking about, they're never aggressive unless you grab at it and hold it in your fingers, it'll, it'll feel like stabbing yourself with a lead pencil, like a pencil, you know, like a honeybee or a wasp. A lot of times when people get stung. Is that the one that burrows itself in the hole in the ground? There's, yes. Well, if, if you notice it, it might be a wasp, but yes, this, this lives in the ground. But there's about 300 species in Massachusetts that live in the ground, so this is one of them. And then here's its face. What is the name of it? This one's called Helictus ligatus. It's a sweat bee. Okay, so yeah. you want to say sweat bee. Yeah, and then you know how they say people have eyes in the back of their head? Yeah. Bees have eyes in the top of their head. One, two, three. And these can't see, I'll just talk about the three eyes right up here. These, these can't see uh, like an image, like we see an image. How many people have tried to kill a fly but missed? <laughs> okay? When you come down and hit it, those eyes see shadow, contrast. So when you're coming down, it's like a shadow going over it and the, the fly or the bee immediately knows to fly away. 
So, little tidbit, if you want to kill a fly more effectively, run your hand slowly next to it because it can't see you, and then hit it. It'll increase your success rate from like 5% to 90%. Not that I'm advocating um, a decimation of flies. But to each his own. Their own. Okay. So, when you look at all this pollen right here, okay, so what's pollination basically? So, think, and the best way to think of this is like lilies or sunflowers on your dining room table or something like that, all the pollen falling off it. So, you'll see like, dry, uh, like kind of like grainy stuff falling off. That's the pollen, that's the male part of the plant. Some plants will have a female part, other plants that separate with male and female are in separate flowers. Right here is the female part of the plant called the stigma, okay? The other male part's called the anthers. So the bee, and this is bringing it to a different flower, will take the pollen from here. It's gonna use most of it for nest, but they're messy, as you saw in the picture earlier. When it gets transferred here, okay, it makes a tube, a tunnel down into here, and then here's where this, like, and this is an apple in this case, that's where the seeds will start to form and the apple will build around it. So you see the flower come off and it's still got kind of that one sticky point coming out. And look at a blueberry. If you have a blueberry bush, you'll see that the stigma part's still attached to it. That's the female part of the plant. And once it's pollinated, it'll drop the flowers pretty quickly. If you go walking looking for pink lady slippers, it's the best way to see this. We have a lot. If you see, they'll last, the flowers will stay on for a week or two or three weeks, but then, it, you know, I notice it, all of a sudden the flower just drops off after a day or two. It's because that one was pollinated and it doesn't need to attract bees to it anymore and starts producing the seeds right there. And that's what's gonna happen a lot of times with these flowers as well, but it, it depends. So here's some pollination by a leaf cutter bee that I took a video of a couple of years ago. This is false indigo, but think of any type of sweet pea or peas that you're planting in your, in, your, in your garden or anything like that. So this is a legume. So this is a false indigo plant that we have. Here's the flower, it's got two parts. Here's the bee right here. It pushes in. As it pushes down, you'll see yellow spots right here touching right under its abdomen right there. And it starts working in, so it's getting nectar, okay? And um, it's getting nectar and it's also getting pollen. So pollen, 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 pollen. But at the same spot, the female part of the plant is gonna be right there as well. And watch it work its legs. So it's working its legs, putting the pollen in the spot that it wants it to, but it's messy and leaving stuff there. So the female part of the plant, when it flies to the next flower, so here's the bee here as well. This is gonna be a little windier, but it, it shows it really well. The female part of the plant is gonna drag along the bee's belly as well, where the pollen's gonna be, and it's gonna pick it up there. Okay, but the thing is, look at it working its legs the whole time, pushing them together to get that pollen and also get the nectar, because this, this plant, uh, Baptisia, false indigo, produces both. Also, this, once you get it established, it lasts and lasts and lasts. Animals don't like to eat it, and it gets a really big bush. It's a really nice plant. So, what does this mean to you? Okay, so let's think if you went to market basket to the supermarket, and you had a choice between strawberries that look like this and strawberries that look like that, okay? These flowers had a bag on them. So, pollen from the strawberry flower itself could only fall onto the female part of the plant, or wind could blow it over. And look, you've got very ugly looking strawberries. If you ever have strawberries like that in your yard, you're like, why am I not getting any? It could be soil, it could be nutrients, it could also just they're not getting pollinated or you don't have enough strawberry plants to cross pollinate because it's gotta come from a different individual strawberry. And then you've got the nice round strawberry flower here. And that bee that's on this flower right here, and this can be honeybees or other bees too, it's only this big. That's the same size bee that's on the flower. This one's actually probably a little too big. <laughs> this one's actually bigger than the picture. But it gives you the same idea. And again, you could have hundreds to thousands of those within a, you know, a, a two-minute walk from your, your front door. And then look at the cucumber. Just think if you got this in a salad or as part of your sandwich. See, it's all kind of shriveled up right here, seeds here, and then a full cucumber. So it didn't get pollinated, so the plant doesn't put energy and resources in there because it can't produce the seeds that it wants. Because the plants don't want bees stealing nectar from it and pollen. They want the pollen going from one individual cucumber, in this case, to another. And if it doesn't, they're not going to waste their time and energy because they have limited resources to produce seed, to produce fruit, when it's not going to help the seeds uh, make a new cucumber plant there. 
So what is a bee? You know, we all have a general idea. Here's a bumblebee, mostly what I've been talking about here. All right. But what we usually know of bees are these strange bee wasp kind of hybrids. Thanks to Winnie the Pooh. Okay. You have honey spilling out of trees. They're kind of wasp-like mostly because they just attack them. The queen flies out here. There is balloons and rain clouds and everything. The updated version is from the bee movie is where we get most of our information. So in this one, and my daughter's just telling me to shut up, is it's Jerry Seinfeld as a male. Males don't have stingers. They can't sting. Stingers are for laying eggs and also defense. But they tell me just died, so I just can't watch movies with them sometimes. Or I know I, I get kicked out of the room here. And then we're all familiar with honeybees, but mostly with honeybees, we don't think of honeybees that are wild or feral in this case. We think of them being in colonies, so big white boxes right there. You know, here's a honeybee. Uh, it's a little hard to see with the honeybees right there on a dandy line, just on ground level. But they're insects, so they're going to have a head, three parts, a thorax and an abdomen. And most females will usually have a special area for carrying pollen. With honeybees and bumblebees, it's a pollen basket. So these are mostly bees around here. I just want to show you a little bit of a diversity. So here uh, is the common eastern bumblebee. That was in the video. This right here is a carpenter bee, okay? So this might be the bee that's flying around near your sheds, and this is on sumac. If you look at your fingernail uh, on your pinky finger, this is about half the size of it right here. That's on a vine called Virginia Creeper from Provincetown, where I took that one. But this is going to be in Brockton, in DW Fields right here. And one of the most common larger bees in your yard is one you might not look at, but it's this bright green bee right here. And that's a green sweat bee, and I've seen them coming out to my blanket flowers already in my yard in Mansfield. And if you start to look, especially on cone flowers or black-eyed Susans or other just open type of daisy sunflowers, these are nesting right in the garden, right in your grass, especially if they have room. And I'll talk about that too. So how do they get the nectar up, like their tongues and stuff like that? I like this one. This bee, when you look at it, if, if you see it here, it's actually silvery. That, that, that's kind of a cheat, though, because I took that picture when I was doing some research in Arizona with the American Museum. But they're all going for nectar in some way right here. So again, it's just a little hard to see because of the light. Here's the mouth. I'm going to do this in red if it shows up. So I'm looking at the middle part of the screen. So that's the jaw or the mandible right here. So picture your jaw, okay? And then picture instead of your tongue being in your mouth, picturing it being like a sword in a way, but just in a sheath and then it comes out like this, okay? All right, and at the end on your hand, like right there, again, this is not exactly how it's happening, but I think it's the best way to see it. On your hand, long tongue or short tongue. Bees can have long or short tongues depending on the species. And think, flowers can have long or short areas where the nectar or pollen might be. So here's what shoots out. And I'm not gonna use the technical terms other than once. It's the gloss and the labella, whoops. And then right here, picture your hand or the end of the tongue being Velcro. And think how it might, might be nice to pick things up with Velcro right there. But how does that work with like nectar? Well, if you have Velcro and you put water in it, it can sit in there. But then picture celery. Okay, and anybody, is everybody familiar with putting celery in like a glass of red water and it turns red or whatever like that? So picture the Velcro all having tiny little holes in it. And when it puts it into the nectar, the capillary action draws up the nectar right away. So it's not even sucking it up, it's just coming up uh, without any energy or force right there. So it's like a Velcro tongue in a way to pick up the pollen and the nectar right there. All bees will have special pollen carrying hairs, and you can see this up close with the bees that I have in the cases over there. Some will be under their abdomen, some will be on part of their leg, and some will be entirely on their leg. Like these three are right here, okay? And those hairs can be thick, are typically thicker, and they're branched, almost like a feather. And I'm going to show a close-up picture like that, too. But they can come in many different colors. Okay. This is, it's, again, it's a little hard to see, so I'm just going to walk around. This was the thing. But they can be bright green, blue, purple, red. You can see the one on the lower left, okay, looks a lot more like an ant with wings on it. But that's because bees are in the same group as ants. And the one on the top uh, left from here, that's a purplish blue. And those can be, in some of the species, green and red and purples. And those are orchid bees from the tropics. So that's a little bit of a cheat. 
But who knows with climate change, maybe we'll have those up here eventually. <laughs> I was just going to say, how come mine look green to me? Yeah. yeah, we have, this is the most common one we have. It was in the hole. Yeah, we just yeah. The most the, common one. This is the probably the most right. common it little one that you're not afraid of. It. But that's, that's. Um, so it won't sting me. You, you'd have to grab it and like squeeze it ah, in your okay. hand. Yeah, like they're just, okay. they don't want to have anything to do with anything big. They just okay. want to get their pollen and go home. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I won't that, that's so actually, the next yeah. Time. And, cover up the whole. and then I'll talk about uh, risk with wasps and stuff like that, okay. and when you want to look at those, the differences there. Because the, so the big thing that people are concerned about a lot is you know you know what's the difference between a wasp and a bee? Bees are vegetarians; they're just getting pollen and nectar. They can sting as a defense of the females with the stinger. Wasps are carnivorous. Uh, you want any type of horror story? Uh, learn what wasps do to the things that they're eating. Uh, yeah, so I won't go into it, but I mean, they have nothing, Hollywood has nothing on what wasps and other animals are capable of here. Um, they can be typically more aggressive, especially in the fall when the colonies get bigger. Uh, they'll be more silvery and they have larger, like, uh, they can typically have larger nests where you don't want them in, in your trees or in your lawn. Do right wasps there. Do anything good? Well, yeah, they're eating all, they're, they're basically killing a lot of the pest species that you're worried about in your gardens and on your plants. So they're really, really important checks on uh, insect populations getting too high for a lot of species. So like, be like beetles you don't like and other things that you don't like right there. They're also the most, probably the most diverse insect group in the entire world because one wasp, a lot of wasps are like have a one-to-one -one relationship. Like they will only feed their kids this this beetle, or they'll only do it like that. So there's well over a million wasps um, in the world, and it could be could be a fair bit higher than that too. But a lot of them are so small you would never even see them, and they're not the ones that would ever sting you because sometimes the, the stinger can be like this big, okay, which seems scary, but they're using it to go in through uh, tree bark. To, to, to sting a beetle that actually lives in tree bark, and then lay eggs in the beetle, and then the beetle will be eaten from the tree bark. So but that, that's as far as I'll go with that, okay. Um, you can have ones that are bright yellow and red and silvery right here. These, are, these bees actually steal pollen from other bees. So in, in a very different way than you're expecting. They're called kleptoparasitic, like a, klept, a kleptomaniac. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that here, but they don't have many hairs because they're actually not carrying pollen. They're, in a way, stealing it from another bee. You've got ones that are metallic -y colors and reddish colors. Here are a few species of bumblebees. This one, it's hard to see, but it's black, yellow, red, yellow, black. This, will, this is in Brockton occasionally. Here's another one that's all yellow, can be black and red. I took this picture in France, though, so that's not, a, you know, you won't see that one around here. And then here's a very large one that I took in, a picture that I took in Arizona uh, in the deserts there. But here's a close-up image of, of, a, of a leaf cutting bee. Uh, this is about the size of a thumbnail, okay, maybe a little bit bigger. And here's its face, so eye, eye, jaw, tongue, proboscis, okay, front leg front leg right there, antenna, antenna. And these pictures are, are create, taken um, from somebody who taught me a lot about bees. Uh, it's Sam Drogi in his lab at the United States Geological Survey down in Maryland. And the reason the resolution on these pictures is so good, it's hard to see just because of the light here, is because this is a composite of anywhere between 50 and 400 pictures that they take and they move it on a rail so they can move it like a tenth of a millimeter and take a picture on top of a picture on top of a picture and then stack all of them together. So instead of like part of it being blurred and part of it being in focus, the whole thing is in focus. And you could print this out and it could cover the entire wall. Like, and they're all, they're all free, but they're, they're a big reason of why we know, we're starting to know a lot more about bees and learning about the health of their population. But this is that, this is that green bee you were talking about in your yard okay. right here or well, something similar to that. Awesome. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. don't. Well, some will have four. Some will have four wings, but between a fly and a bee, flies will have two wings. Uh -huh. The other two wings in flies evolved into basically a, a gyroscope hydrometer that that sits behind it. But like dragonflies have four wings, but it's 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 a lot different. So the bees bees will have four wings, but they hook them together, and I can show that. So that so sometimes it might look like they're two wings. They can hook and unhook the wings as well too. Mm -hmm. Yes. <coughs> Keep talking about eyes. Do they work at the same? Same way that 
human eye works? Or is it so that was a plant. The question here was, do they work on the same way as the human eyes? Because I just happen to have an eye up on the screen here. So thank you for that question. So, so here, it's hard to see. But every dot that I make is an eye. OK, so here's the entire eye right here. And can you see like the little red dots that are going across? So every point here going across, there's like a 1,000 eyes there, OK? Um, and let me just, I'll just show briefly going around. So every one of those dots makes an image, okay? So, it, so, so every one of those dots will make an image. So, so from far away, they can see really well, okay? But when they get closer, the, the, the eyes are all picking up a different image there. So it becomes like pixelated in a way. So, they, so the way we're looking, just picture instead of having one eye, you have a thousand eyes that go around your jaw and basically to the side of your ear and the back in there. And then you're forming an image that way. So the insect eye evolved completely differently than the human eye. Same thing, and then the squid eye evolved differently as well, even though they're more closely related to insects right there. So they can see better when something is farther away from them. That's what we think, yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. And then we also think, but it's not too well known, that a lot of their long distance way of finding flowers is not done through vision, but it's done through scent. Um, a lot of that research that hasn't been published, but a, a colleague of mine in the 70s uh, was off of Cunningham and Petakees Island on the Elizabeth Island, so near Martha's Vineyard, and he'd take squash flowers out, take squash flowers, put them in airtight containers, take his boat a mile off the island, open up the flower and within like 10 to 30 minutes he'd see bu bumblebees tracking like this and then landing on his boat and it where he was was below the horizon line where they actually could not it was impossible to see where he was until they got closer so they were they were then the scent there though so bee so insects in general don't really talk the way well, they don't talk the way we talk they can speak through vibrate they communicate through vibration stuff like that but like on the antenna, parts of their face, when you go, well, I'll show microscopic pictures of their leg, they've got all these incredible mechanical and chemical sensors in there. So they're communicating most of the time through scents or through chemicals, pheromones. Like if you get stung by wasps, why are there 50 more coming at me? It's because they smell you. You've been tagged to be destroyed, basically, okay? Lovely. For example, when I was in Belize collecting bees, um, with the American Museum, uh, uh, somebody from Japan, Canada Agriculture, uh, my friend, colleague Atsushi was here, okay, he's a professor in Japan, and uh, we're walking, and I'm here, and he walks by the tree this side, I walk by this side, and then he's just screaming in Japanese, running past me, because his shoulder brushed into a wasp nest, and I'm hearing, like a car is driving by, but there, it's a whole colony of wasps going right by my ears, not stinging me, and he, once you get about 100 yards away, they, you know, they're like, okay, he's not a threat anymore. And he only got stung a couple of times, fortunately, but, like, cause, but he was tagged with that scent. Yeah, so if you ever get stung, just get away because it's a pheromone indicator. Yeah. Yes? I think that uh, certain people have a scent on them that is more attractive to bees than uh, other people. I don't know about in terms of bees, because bees are looking, and same thing with wasps, they're looking for, like, uh, caterpillars if you're a wasp or something like that and bees are looking for pollen and nectar. In terms of mosquitoes and other biting flies where they're where they're using carbon dioxide and others other sensors that are indicating of some type of life in there, then definitely. Really? Yeah, I think I think there but I don't know I don't know what it is. Okay. But I think it's I think I think it's likely. I'll be conservative. I think it's likely that 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 that, that can be the case. Yes. Uh, just a comment uh, I would be in the garden with my mother the same evening. Mosquitoes are out. And she would always be saying, How oh, come you're not getting the mosquitoes are all over me? And uh, we began to think it was because of the hairspray. Mm hmm. Yeah. She bothered me and then chased around. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard about the yeah. And so here is a longhorn bee, and you can see the large hairs on the back of its leg. And here's that same bee covered in pollen. Um, all in yellow. Oh, and so, just so you know, like, wh why is this picture be all clean and this be all covered in pollen? There's two ways to collect bees. This is 
collecting like in a net and then you're putting it in some type of pesticide and it's dying, you're putting it in a pin so we know that it's there. Here, what's happening here is we also have little cups filled with soapy water that reflect ultraviolet light. The bee will fly into the cup with soapy water. There's no surface energy so it sinks and it drowns and it's a way to get to kill a very small number of bees to know what's actually there to understand what the population is. So with this one, if people are interested in a workshop, you have to wash the bee in water, in soap, and then in water, and then you have to blow dry the bee and style it. And I'm not joking. I have blown dry, all, most of the bees in there have been blown dried and pinned, and dried out and pinned. So if you need any tips on bee styling, I, I can help with that, okay? But back to the bee we looked at earlier with the pollen. Now this is gonna, so here's the face. You can start to see that the, 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 the hairs, they're called scopa, but I'm just gonna refer to them as hairs, but the, the right term is scopa. The hairs here don't reflect a lot of light, okay? Wasps reflect light a lot of times because then they look silvery. And it's a, function of the, it's a function of their actual hair. So it's a little hard to see because of the lighting here. This is uh, it's magnified 200 times, this is uh, 2,000 times. This is the back leg. This is a big spike coming off the back leg that measures humidity. But each one of the hairs is branched a lot. There's lots of branches. So it almost absorbs light as opposed to reflected. And if you look here, it's magnified about 2,000 times. There's all these hairs coming off the bee. And what that allows you to do, what that allows the bee to do, okay, is for the pollen to stick until it cleans itself off and puts it where it wants it to go. But you can see how much pollen is here, so it's gonna miss some of the pollen, and that's why they're so good at pollinating plants. Even though the bees just want the pollen, and the plants want the pollen back, you know, there's kind of this balance um, with the species here. Otherwise, the plants wouldn't produce as much pollen and nectar um, if it wasn't beneficial. So what bees do we have, and how many are in the world? 20,000 species have been described. The book with most of these in there, just to groups, weighs about 40 pounds if you want to take a look at it. But there's realistically probably 30 or 40,000 species, if not higher, in the world. In, the, in North America, probably about 4,000 bees. Could probably higher. 3,000 are on the West Coast. Bees are more diverse in desert and Mediterranean environments, okay, due to the environmental conditions and the flowers that are there. Israel, uh, Greece, some of the highest diversities in the world. Turkey as well, like that very desert uh, Mediterranean environment with not a lot of rain. In the East Coast is about 1,000 species, about 450, maybe a little higher in New England. And we've, uh, uh, Michael Veet and uh, some people at UMass uh, Amherst along with others have uh, documented 367 species in Massachusetts. It's probably closer to 400. Did anybody think there was that many bees here? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Pat. Yeah. My question was, yeah. The ranges of some are expanding. Uh, excuse me, the ranges are shifting, like north, for some of the species. Some, um, so they're start, that's why they're doing these large scale collections of small samples to see where the populations are. Because if you went back 50 years, there's only very small isolated pockets of where we know where a lot of the bees in here actually were, because they're so small and understudied. So you're starting to see some shifts with their, and sometimes they try the plants, sometimes they don't, yep. So that's, that, that's really important to start doing now so we can start to see what, yep. So in terms of the bees that are here, you're familiar probably with bumblebees and honeybees. These are the social bees that form colonies, okay? But most bees do not form colonies at all. It's a single female collecting pollen, digging a nest or building a nest, laying eggs in the nest with pollen and, le and shut, basically closing it down. The bees live in darkness, okay, for 90 to 95 percent of their life eating pollen and then when the environmental conditions are right, they dig themselves out, they chew themselves out and they come out for, you know, a couple of weeks or maybe a whole summer just depending on the species, okay. Here's a list of them but I'm just going to show pictures of them instead. So about 70 of those species nest in the ground, okay. Um, and then the other 25 to 30% nest in cavities. They're either squatters, so they're using tunnels that already exist. That can be like if you have milkweed or hollow plant stems in your yard or plant stems that are born out. 
So their nest by, by insects, rotting wood and trees that might have beetles in there, they're nesting in there. And then you've got your carpenter bee, if you're, you, you think of a shed, why are they all near the shed? They're actually drilling holes in wood. And then there's also another group of carpenter bees that again is about this big um, that you would never even notice because they don't have any impact, like negative impact on your yard or anything. So our biggest group of mining bees is called Andrina. And in the springtime is when they're most diverse because they're coming out when all the unique flowers and tr flowering trees and flowering plants are coming out. But here is just three different species going to goldenrod in the fall because a lot of species will come out um, and go just to goldenrod. But here's one that looks, this is a, this again, this is it up close. Here's its eye, here's its antenna. And this is coming out for like hollies in the springtime, okay, or um, birches, willows uh, in the springtime there. And so here's its eye, here's its back leg thick with, with hair uh, to carry the pollen there. And then here's a different species right here on a fall aster, right there. You have longhorn bees, Okay, called Melisodes um, that are in the state. There's not as many longhorn bees here, but these a lot will be in the summertime at squash, in the fall on sunflowers. But I mean, just look how, just look at the structure. Look how look how beautiful they can be. Okay, with the yellows and the oranges, and this is about the size of just where your thumb can go up and down on the knuckle right there. And then here it is covered in pollen. And here it is not covered in pollen. On the, so you're looking down on it. And here it is covered in pollen, looking down on it. And then here it is. Here, this is its face. Okay. This is its face covered on pollen. Seems like a bad 80s public service <laughs> announcement. Right here. Right. And then there's another group of mining bees, and this is, this is my, one of my favorite bees right here. This, these are called Caledes, and they call them plaster or polyester bees because they have glands in their mouth along with other glands in their body. Well, they'll take a waxy substance and line their entire nest in the ground. Because just imagine trying to raise a family in the ground, okay? There's fungus, there's viruses, there's bacteria. You have to keep it dry. And so, they, so you have to keep it protected. And a lot, so there's all these really wonderful adaptations. The bee here, it's hard to see in the screen. This is just its head, and it's flying on a, it's just coming off a flower where I took a picture. So the head and everything else is out of focus. And it's on a flower that's probably three or four times bigger than right here. If you're, you know, in March and you really want it to be springtime, and you're walking, you see like tiny little white flowers on the ground that are yes. no bigger than this. Yes. So these are called drava right here. And right when these come out, other bees start coming out that are larger and smaller than it. But this one is really neat because this is the nest right here. Here's its hole right here. I was sitting in between probably 300 of these nests with my one and a half year old daughter um, without even realizing it in east in a sheep pasture. She was sweeping the ground, but it was very messy, a lot of pine needles and stuff. You know, one year olds like to be very tidy in the, in the woods. Um, and I'm watching her, and then I realized this, you know, I was like, I, you know, I took for granted that they were everywhere, and they're flying around here not bothering her or anything. And in the springtime, on white pine and other pine trees, I'll find a lot of males and females on the pine trees, and especially on the needles, doing weird things with the needles, like running, the, running their bodies across the needles, running their face across the needles. I'm not sure what they're doing, but I suspect they're collecting like resin or other waxy stuff from the needles and actually incorporating that in their nests. Because why did the tree start to produce resin? To kill off something. Could be a beetle getting into it, could be fungus, could be something else. Why is it waxy? There could be properties in there that it's using. And this is, this is one thing a lot of researchers are looking at and how bees actually make or use their own antibiotics. And, in the back? Yes. Yes. What happens to all these ground looking bees during heavy rainstorms? They, 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 they deal with it. They just deal with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, so it could be the architecture uh, of their nest. Think of like having an eave on a roof right. like that. It could be the way that the water flows. They're going to be in soils. Depending on the species, they'll be in soils that might drain well. They might, they might have nests in specific parts because they're going to be able to, you know, we don't know what they're doing, but where they're choosing their nest, they're, they're dealing with rain. So they're probably able to taste, get senses from the ground of like, and that tells them the evaporation race, or yeah, that the, 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 they know through, through their uh, DNA and evolution there. But yeah, uh, and if they picked a bad spot, they die. Yeah. 
like you know that that that's where natural selection is going to come in there too. Yep. Or if you know uh, things change, and then here's the bee up close, and you can actually see the branching patterns on its face right here of the hairs, and then here it is on the side. But when you see this, it's spring. Okay. Do 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 we know if they have a max load, and does it make it more difficult for the bee to fly? Once they start to reach their upper limit, you mean in pollen, like how much pollen they can carry, they're going to go back and drop it off. And then just to show you the size of the body, that's the stinger right there. That little part right there. So again, more like a pencil. You know, some can hurt, some can't hurt, but again, I've never, I've only been stung but about 10 times and it's usually because I'm doing something stupid. And what I mean by stupid is just being careless, like I could grab the bee or something like that. But you can have green bees here as well too, okay? This one you'll see in your gardens, in planters. And look at the colors. You ever think you could have colors like that up here? Okay. And so, like, what is just a solitary bee? You know, like, what does it mean to nest in the ground? Okay. So I just want to go through a little bit of a life cycle here and then talk a little about cavity nesting bees and then uh, answer any questions. So the adults you're familiar with going to flowers and stuff like that, but most of its life is spent underground. It will dig a nest in the soil, so just picture a tunnel. It'll create like little cells, or I'll just call them apartments, okay? It'll collect pollen, could be eight, it could have to go 800 to 8,000 trips to the flowers, depending on the, just think of all the flowers that have to go just to get enough pollen for one, one cell to rate. Once it has enough pollen, it mixes it with nectar in most cases, and it lays an egg. The egg hatches, but you know like when you crack an eggshell, like a chicken egg, and it, you, the eggshell breaks? So when this hatches, it just reabsorbs the shell. Wow. So the shell just goes back into its body. I don't know, it's really not hatching. I don't know what to call it, but... And then picture a caterpillar or like a fly, like a grub or a maggot, that's what it'll look like. And it eats the pollen, and then when it's done, it goes through a partial metamorphosis to kind of look like an adult bee that's all white. Might not, wings might not be filled, and that's how it's going to sit in basically like a little cave in the ground or in a cell until the right environmental conditions that occur. It could be rain, could be temperature, could be soil, um, could be a lot of other things in here. Then when the time's right, it's going to dig itself out and fly away. So here's an example. This is some work that I was doing. I was taking a course on uh, bee ecology in the deserts in Arizona. So this was a, this was the American Museum of Natural History. This is Jerry Rosen, the foremost expert in bee nesting in, in the entire world. I like this picture a lot because it shows how civilized the research is. We have khakis, colored shirts. It is sunny, it is warm. You're not out at all hours of the night or the morning in the rain. Uh, you get up at night, you leave at nine, you get back at four. We had to have mandatory gin and tonics at five on the porch, <laughs> looking at the mountains in the desert there. But what we're doing here is bees are nesting in the ground, we're trying to figure out what species. He's actually trying to suck some up out of there into a little vial right there. Now, it would never go into his mouth, but that's, that's what's happening here. But they're nesting in just sandy soil like this. So there's a dime, picture like a little pencil hole in the ground, little soil coming up. So these are all bee nests here. It's a little hard to see, but here's a ruler, about five inches down here, tunnel, that's one, of those bee, that's one of those pupil bees that are gonna eventually hatch. Well, not anymore, because it was dug up, but. And then there's another one here. It could go down a couple of feet, could just go down a couple of inches. And plus, in terms of the rain, uh, as you can see here, the farther you get down, the less likely the rainfall is gonna go through there, too. Are, are you likely to have a nest, like in, your, in the city, or in your yard, where they're more removed in the woods, or? Let me show you a picture in just a little bit, okay? All right. So here's the, here's the cell that's waterproof, so they'll line it with material that you might not even be able to see. There's the cell filled with pollen, okay, egg, early instar hatches, kind of still looks like a caterpillar here or a grub, okay, goes in, turn metamorphosis into its pre-pupa, and then so here's, the, here's, how, here's where I'll answer your next question, okay. So this bee is called Calides thoracaceus, it's a Calides bee that's out right now, I think going to hollies and other trees. This is a wall on like a river bank or, you know, if you're walking through the woods and you see part of the side of the side collapse and it's all sand or something like that. This is a pair of pliers. Okay, that tiny little picture right there is a pair of pliers. 
And I'm going to circle it just to give you a scale because the resolution is not great because it's on this. That's the pair of pliers in red. Every dot that you see here is a bee nest. So you're looking at about 10,000. This is magnified. Uh, this is expanded in a large. One time I had somebody gasp because they thought the bee was that big. Um, like it was like six times bigger than that. No, no, but that's just magnified. Um, and all the dots are bee nests. So you're looking at 10,000. So just think of if you're walking on the side of the river. Think of the, the kind of the lip with the forest hanging over it so it's protected from the rain right there. Yes? Do any of these solitary bees compete with each other? Is there, is there so, so in this case, no. It's, it's, so it's not, it's not a colony. Every female is laying eggs in their own nest. And they can actually find it with scent. So they can come back here and it smells. And it smells a certain way and they know which one to go into. So they're not mixing it up. I mean, they probably obviously make mistakes. But, but they're leaving each other alone. Yeah, yeah. But if, they're, but, if they're, but if they're trying to get in each other's nests, they'll, they will fight for that and stuff like that. Or if they may fight over when they're just first starting out, too. And while this is all going on with all these females, is the male just in a man cave somewhere hanging out? Or what? <laughs> the male might be lurking there to try and mate. And, and, but basically, it's 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 thrown out. Story. Yeah, and then 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 once then once it's done, they they they're they're just not involved. Yeah, not lurking in a man cave, out terrified on a flower, trying not to get eaten by a bee, uh, by a bird. Yeah, yeah. So here's the ground. Okay, ground right here. The female will shovel out a nest using her her mouth her mandibles that are built like a shovel, and her back legs. It'll dig a cell, pollen, nectar, and then once that's all done, here's a cell, here's a cell, here's an apartment, here's an apartment, here's an apartment, here's an apartment. Pollen in the bottom, egg right here. <clears throat> right here, in this picture right here, which is a little hard to see with the pedestal, this is from a study from 1980 in a suburban like one acre lawn in Maryland, over 100,000 bee nests in the lawn, and the person didn't know it. So if you do not have compacted sod, you can still have grass, but I mean, when, you know, like when you look, no matter where you push away, you don't see any dirt, you will have bees nesting in there. They need like, you know, different types of dirt. It could be clay, I mean, clay's not great, but some will nest in clay, sand, more loamy, it all depends. You don't have three, three inches of mulch, you have one half inch of mulch, bees will nest in there. Think of walking through the woods, all the leaves that are down there, they'll nest underneath the leaves and they create a spatial map to find it back. Here is that polyester nest. See how it's wax? It's like a waxy substance in the ground. So they're making that all with their mouth. And so think of instead of digging with a shovel, they're also doing all the digging with their mouth and their back legs. I mean, imagine digging a foot out being the size of a bee. I can't, I can't even fathom it. I guess that would like be the equivalent of if we dug like, what? A thousand foot tunnel in the ground with our teeth? Anyway, sorry. So here is cavity nesting bees, and I just want to show you this one. I want to show you how big this one is. To dig, they have to compact it to make the space. The bee you're looking at on the screen, I can't pin on a regular pin. I have to pin it on a pin. Oh my goodness, that big. <laughs> so above the white? Yeah, yeah above, that's I, thought that was, I thought it was a speck of dust. <laughs> that's the bee that hey, you're looking at on the screen. So I had to pin it on a pin, like a foam, I had to take a foam on there. There's four species like this in the state. This is the only species that's native, not this one that I'm holding or that one, but this is the only group of bees that's native to Hawaii. Why is this group of bees, if they nest in cavities, the only one that's native to Hawaii? Hawaii is five million years old. The lava? Soil? The lava? Because most likely, three million years ago, or how many million years ago, plant material washed up on Hawaii, the plant material had hollow stems, these bees emerged, and you went from one species to several hundred over time. They're also declining pretty rapidly there. But because their house is plant material, their nests are in there, so most likely, however long ago, washed up on the beach and you went from one species, all the different flowers and everything there, and over evolutionary time, went into several hundred. Did uh, I see something in the paper recently about Hawaii's concern about the, the, the bee situation? 
Yeah, yeah. That's it, 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 if they're talking about stuff endangered, it's that little tiny species of bee because there's probably already been uh, over a hundred that have gone extinct that they don't even know about. Just, just Hawaii. Yeah, I could talk a lot about Hawaii um, and islands in general. Here's the carpenter bee that makes its own caddy. Look at the blue color. This is in your yard all the time. Okay, these are these are in yards all the time. We have four species in the state here. I'm just going to go quickly through leaf cutting bees. We have leaf cutting bees. Okay, they can be they can use leaves or mud. This is a not a leaf cutting bee. Here, I'm just going to use it with my hand. See the jaw? It's very small. The mandibles there. This is the giant. Uh, resin bee, that's the jaw. Massive. Here's the mining bee jaw, small, like a shovel. Here are them next to each other, massive jaw, small shovel-like jaw. Nesting in the ground, nesting in cavities. Here's another leaf cutting bee called an osmia bee. This, this uses mud too. Huge jaw. So why do they have these huge jaws? Has anybody ever seen this on their plants? Yeah. Perfect circles? Yeah. The bees cutting out a perfect circle of leaves. It rolls it up. It flies away with the leaves. Anybody ever see leaves like this? Yes. Yeah. And you ever wonder what they were? I thought they were caterpillars. Uh, they were caterpillars. Perfect circles, like almost nearly perfect circles. They do it on flowers. And what they do, and this is a diagram from a, a, an old German publication is they make these into like a cylinder or a cup. They fly back, they put these cylinder cups in wood of, of a, or any other material, a structure inside that cylinder cup is where they're putting their pollen, their nectar, uh, the pollen nectar ball and laying their egg, just like the same apartments or the cells <coughs> of the ground nesting bees. It's like a light. And so what you might see this now is like you see bee hotels or people drilling holes or you go to a garden center and they've got all these stems out. That's a bee in a bee hotel, okay? If you just, most garden centers are starting to carry them now. But it's just, it's the equivalent of using plant stems to give habitat to these leaf cutting bees. So you can also use a router and route out wood this way. So that's, what, that's the picture here. Just picture a flat board and it's routed out at a certain size. Certain bees need certain sizes. So here is the, is, the, is the cavity, there's the leaves, there's the leaves, there's the leaves, there's the leaves, there's the leaves. So here's the leaf cutting bee. So one, two, three, four, five bees are in there. Babies that are eating the pollen right now are, are actively collecting it here. It's so tiny. Yeah, it, they, they really, and they can be large or small. I mean, they're all small relative. And then here, this is an observation one, so there's a little blurry because there's plexiglass here, but here's the bee actually building it. And you can see there's the pollen, and it's not complete yet. And then here's what it looks like in a plant stem. Okay, here's the stem itself. Here's the mud. So this is a mason bee. So instead of using leaves, it's using mud. Here's the plant stem cut in half. There's the egg. There's the pollen. And just again, just I want to show you the numbers, like the dramatic numbers, how how large this can be. So this is a picture from the 1970s in Cairo, Egypt. Jerry Rosen, who was in the khakis earlier, was doing research then uh, in Egypt. This is the apartment here. This is the, this is the married couple that lives in the apartment. You can see there's a lot of texture on the wall here. Again, it's a little hard to see, but every dot here is a beak nesting in their wall. Well over 20,000 species of bees in this one tiny apartment block in Egypt where Jerry was doing the studying. 20,000 species? Just 20,000 individuals, oh. yeah, of the same, most like, well, it could be could, more than one species, but not 20, could even be up to 100,000 here, okay? Every dot right here. So that's why these leaf cutting bees, with the way that they can form these aggregated colonies, here's an alpha, alpha farm in Oregon or which, uh, out in the, in the northwest. Here's a shed in the middle of it. And if you look inside the shed, it's all these blocks of wood with holes in it. And every hole has a bee nest in it of these leaf cutting mason or uh, osmia bees, so the mason bees here. And every, so they're using the alfalfa to pollinate the alfalfa, and they're using that pollen to um, raise their next generation while also 
uh, pollinating the agriculture there. So like the numbers, uh, and a, a lot of times, can be really, really large and you would never notice. And the last part about the leaf cutting bees I wanted to talk to you about is this. This is from a, the J John Asher, um, a friend of mine from the University of Singapore, and then Jerry Rosen, who I talked about earlier, went to Turkey and they found this. And these are all flower petals from a leaf cutting bee here that makes the most beautiful nests out of flowers. And again, this is like half the size of your pinky fingernail. They make the same cup nests out of the flowers. They plant, they put the cup nest and says some plant material here. The bee lives right there. Here's the pollen. And we just look at the colors right here. And right here, here's the egg. And sometimes they even nest in snail shells. Okay, there's only two or three in the country. This is for, this is for, this is a picture. Of, these are hard to find. This is from Europe, but a couple can do that in North America as well. The adult will make again. It's just like a tunnel. Rocks, 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 rocks. Pollen, baby. So it will actually chew out through the rocks and push itself out to get back up. But they'll use snail shells too, as well. Um, there. So just in, and again, just in the interest of time, some things that you can do for pollinators, okay, and supporting native plants, is small things with habitat can make a very large difference. Okay, so you can provide food for them, and food can be in terms of like pollen nectar. So plants that have different structures and produce different types of pollen and nectar sources, so long flowers, open flowers, they can be native or non-native. Natives are typically better. But the food, so here's a geranium. The food isn't just for the bees. The food can also be for a lot of other insects that are really important. If you're concerned about birds, and birds are declining, especially with climate change, picture a chickadee, okay? Um, if you want, like for example, a chickadee nest that you might have seen in your yard, five chickadees over, to raise five chickadees over like five, the five weeks it needs to, those parents need to collect, and just imagine being the person in charge of counting this. How many caterpillars? Just think. It needs to collect at least 5,000 caterpillars in like four or five weeks for just five chickadee babies. Not like, not like a thousand, just five. Okay. If they collect only two to three thousand, maybe you'll survive one or two. Okay. So if you have if you have more plants that are supporting, uh, and specifically native plants that are supporting native wildlife, you're not just the caterpillars are really important. And other insects are really important for the bird health because you can see like birds like this is on a cherry. It's trying to get insects in there as part of its migration. You know, and these are some birds that'll be, these, these, both those birds would have been in DW fields. Uh, this one's probably nesting in DW fields, and the other one would have migrated through a couple weeks ago. So diversity of plants, so lots of different types of plants. And then, okay. And then also habitat too. So leaving some areas that, that, that are sandy or soily. And this could, grass could be growing up around so you don't see them. It's just an easier to picture, okay? And then also mowing your lawn more. I'm just I'm gonna finish in just 30 seconds. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm just finishing up. Yep, okay, all right. And then providing habitat, and then just even mowing your lawn at three inches instead of one inch, okay? Can make a big difference too. It also, you'll have to use less water and it'll retain more soil and more insects there. And so planting natives, providing areas for where they can nest, and non-natives can be fine too, just typically. Um, one last thing, like a Japanese dogwood has maybe zero to five insects that eat it. A native dogwood has like 150. Native maples and oaks can have up to 450. Non-natives might have 30 to 50. It all depends on the ind individual, but usually if it's native, insects that live here have a long relationship with it and they're more likely to be able to use it. So let me know. I'd like, love to answer any questions, and I hope that it wasn't too boring. <laughs>